Well, let the church say amen. amen. So good to see you all tonight. I want to greet all of you that are here worshiping with us at, uh, at Hope Church tonight. And uh, tonight we are doing the first live stream we've ever done. And uh, the reason is we have so many people that are traveling uh, for the holidays that are with loved ones um, um, throughout the country and around the world. And so we wanted to, uh, to worship with them tonight. And so we welcome all of you that are watching uh, our services online tonight. We had hesitated from uh, doing the services online for a long time. The media and tech team wanted to do it. I insisted we not. And they said, why? I said, I'm scared. I'm going to say something stupid. <laughs> and they said, Daddy never stopped you before. So, <laughs> so uh, I guess the whole world needs to know. huh? <laughs> so we want to welcome you uh, to Hope Church. Uh, whether you're worshiping with us here in the sanctuary uh, or whether you're watching it uh, on some device uh, somewhere throughout the world. Uh, I'm going to invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2. And uh, tonight uh, we're going to begin looking at, um, at the third, um, what scholars call formula quotations. In Matthew chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 2, we see three events that take place, and all three events are accompanied by an Old Testament prediction that it would happen. The first we see is that, uh, the, first, the first of those three that we see is that, um, that the child will be called Jesus, and that he will save his people from their sins. The second quotation we see is that the child will be born in a village called Bethlehem. And it is a reminder that, uh, that the coming Messiah will not come from, great, from a great, great thriving metropolis, but rather a small shepherd country, as we said this past Sunday, a hayseed town where the king would promise to be come from. And it is a reminder that, uh, that not only God is faithful to his word and to his promise that the Messiah would come, but also that God can show up in the most uh, unspectacular of places. And that gives us hope because he shows up in um, oftentimes our unspectacular lives. Well, the third quote we uh, come across this morning is in the second part of Matthew chapter 2. And uh, I want to give you the context of it. In fact, uh, I'll, I'll read it to you. Beginning in chapter 2, verse 4, after Herod had found out that the Messiah, the king of the Jews, was going to be born, he began a um, campaign to eliminate all the children, all the male children in that community that were two, year, two years old and under. And it was a fulfillment of a prophecy that we see in Jeremiah. So I'm going to read these, uh, this short passage and then look at this verse for just a few minutes. Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 16. It said, When Herod heard or saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all the region who were two years old and under. According to the time, that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then what was filled, fulfilled was spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. This is the third of those formula quotations. Verse 18. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph, saying, Rise and take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he arose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he had heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Verse 18 again. 
A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Father, we pray that you will be with us tonight as we look to your word and as we celebrate the birth of Christ, your Son, our Savior. And it's his name we pray. Amen. If you uh, go to the Hallmark store and you pick up a Christmas card, uh, oftentimes you will see a Bible verse, particularly having to do with the birth of Jesus uh, on the inside of that card. You might open up a, a card and it has a star on the front and it might say something like, unto us is born this day in the city of David a child. You might see something like, uh, unto us a child is born or or something along the lines of, uh, of uh, the shepherds keeping watch over their flocks by night. I've been to a lot of Hallmark stores, and uh, I've looked at a lot of cards, but I've never seen a Christmas card with this verse in it. Open up a, open up a Christmas card, and you see the word, a voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children, she refusing to be comforted because they are no more. You're not going to see that on a, on a Hallmark card. But nonetheless, it was significant. Uh, and it was significant because in these three passages, we see something um, about the birth of Jesus that shows how glorious he is. In the first, we see about his name, that he will be called Jesus, that he will be called Emmanuel, the God who's with us, the God who saves. We see also the birthplace of his, uh, we, we see his birthplace is significant. That in Bethlehem, not least among all the places of Judea, is the place where the Messiah is going to be born. And in this passage, we learn something that is not only equally significant, but something that touches all of us in a very deep way. And that is that there are, there's, there's a purpose for the tears that God's people shed. That they may not have cards with, uh, with these words on it, but you listen to, uh, you, you listen to, the, to the Christmas station long enough and you're going to hear about a blue Christmas every once in a while. You'll, you'll hear, hear about a, a hard candy Christmas every once in a while. You'll hear about a Christmas that just isn't the same because a loved one is not there this year. Christmas is a time for laughter. It's a time for joy. It's a time for celebration. But sometimes it's also a time for tears. The question is, what do our tears teach us? What, what, what do these tears here teach us. And, and if tears are a part of life, then they must be part of something God is doing for something even greater. When Rachel is weeping, when the women in the city are weeping over the loss of these children, there must be something that God is trying to teach them. And more important, there must be something that he's trying to teach us. I'm convinced if we look at this verse that there's a handful of things that we can learn. That the first thing that we can learn in these tears, in this passage and in our tears, is this. That is that um, we live in a world that is broken, that is fallen, and that is painful. I, I know that may not surprise you. But the whole reason that we have tears is tears tell us that things are not the way that they ought to be. One of the criticisms that people will make of, of God is they will say, if God is truly good and if God is truly powerful and if God is truly loving, then why on earth, if there, was, if there really was a God, why on earth would there be so much pain? The fact that there's pain on earth and the fact that you and I acknowledge that there's pain on earth, it in some ways testifies to the fact that there is a God. 
Because it communicates to us that yes, things are created, but things are not the way that they ought to be. And if things are not the way that they ought to be, then there is a creator that, 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 that has all power in his hand and can bring all brokenness back to perfection. That, that, that we serve a God that can, that can heal a broken heart and that can, that can, mend, a, that, that can mend a wound, that can, that, that, that can take a group of people and, and bring us back to who we ought to be. That, that, that when we experience pain in life, it is a sign that things really can and ought to be better than they are. And that we have a God that can and will restore all those things back to himself. Our tears remind us that, that yes, things are broken, but they will not be broken forever. There's a second thing our tears remind us in this, stuff, in, in this and, and that is this, that our tears and our cries don't go unheard. Look, 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 look what he says in verse 18. Watch this. A voice was heard in Ramah. That means that when you and I cry out to God, that God hears us. I, I love the fact that we got children cooperating and illustrating that tonight. Amen. When, when, <laughs> I, I just love that. I really do. It, it is a reminder, amen, that, uh, that we have people among us, amen, that are calling out, amen. And I know what they're calling out to. They're calling out for me to wrap it up so they can get some Christmas. I realize, I realize what they're calling out to, but it still, it still illustrates my point. Actually, notice this, tears are a great sign of faith. Well, why do children cry out? They cry out because they know an adult can come to their rescue and can help them out. The, the whole reason a baby cries is a baby has the faith to know that an adult will come and bring healing, uh, bring hope, will, 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 will feed the child or change the child or, or pick the child up or hold the child. That all the crying does is it is a sign of faith that someone will come and rescue that child from whatever situation that child is in. So when you and I cry out to God, when you and I lift up our voices to God, when you and I, when you and I call out to God, even when we weep and we feel no one can hear us, it is actually a sign of faith because we know by weeping, indirectly or directly, that God hears us. Can somebody say amen? Amen. amen. So, so we have great confidence, not just because we know there's a better world. We have great confidence because our tears and our cries don't go unheard. God hears you. The, the third thing that we see in this passage is, is, not, is not, not just that, but that is this. That when you cry and you weep and you go through seasons of pain, that you are not alone. This passage reminds us that other people have gone through pain. Other people have gone through suffering, that, that you are not the only person that has gone through what you're going through. And, and that, that means that it's that, that there's something that, that means that it's not you that everything's wrong with, that life just simply hurts, that it's painful, and other people know how you feel. That, 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 there's a ton of examples in this. But look, 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 it says, it says, a, a voice was heard in Ramah weeping. And not just lamentation, but loud lamenting, loud lamentation. And it says here, Rachel weeping for her children. Now let me give you the context of what's happening here. This, is, this quote is from Jeremiah chapter 31. And it was written uh, sometime between uh, the 5th century and the 8th century before Christ. This was somewhere between, actually the 6th century, this was between 586 B.C. and 722 B.C. It was sometime along those, along those lines. And what had happened was uh, God's people, Israel, were divided into two groups. The, the northern kingdom was called Israel. The southern kingdom was called Judah. And because both of those kingdoms lived in rebellion to God, God had given them over to their enemies. The Syrians had come and taken the northern kingdom captive and uh, took, a, took a bunch of people, it, 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 it took people uh, captive in the northern kingdom. In the southern kingdom, uh, the Babylonians had came and uh, the Babylonians had taken the best people captive 
and took them back to the land of Babylon, which is, which is modern day Iraq. Well, where the staging area that took place with this, was this city called Ramah. And so what's happening at the time is Jeremiah is talking about the historical events that are happening. Jeremiah is talking about these women that are weeping and are crying because their children have been deported to a different region and they would never see them again. These women are, 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 are weeping because they've looked at their child for the last time. Now, hundreds of years later, these women in the same area in Bethlehem are experiencing the same challenges. But more than that, notice this, it says Rachel is weeping for her children. If we go all the way back to Genesis, we, we see a woman named Rachel that was married to a man named Jacob. And uh, Jacob had, had 12 children, and one of his favorite children was named Joseph. His brothers, Joseph's brothers, knew that Joseph was the favorite. And so they, they beat him up and they threw him in a hole and then they were going to kill him. But one of the brothers said, listen, let's not kill him. Why don't we sell him into slavery? So they sold Joseph into slavery to some Egyptians that took Joseph to Egypt. This is Rachel here. Rachel gets the news that her son is gone and is and is never going to be seen again. She doesn't think that he's taken captive. The brothers told her that, uh, that he was killed by, by an animal. So in Genesis, at the beginning of, of the Bible, we see Rachel weeping at the loss of a son. Thousands of years later, we see the women in Babylon, or I'm sorry, the women in Judah and Israel, weeping because they lost children. Then hundreds of years later, we see the women in, in, in Bethlehem weeping because Herod had exterminated the children, the male children, two years and under. Which means there's a pattern that happens over and over again. And that is that, it, it, that, that we suffer and we weep and we cry out because life that is innocent and is lost is taken from us, and we feel that we're the only people that have ever gone through this. But whatever you're going through, whatever economic challenge you're going through, whatever relationship challenge you're going through, whatever just awkward um, relationship challenge among family or loved ones you're going through, whatever, whatever health challenges you're going through, you, you're not the only person that has gone through that. And I don't say that to minimize that. I, I say that to say that whatever you're going through, somebody else is going through it at the same time. Someone's gone through it in the past. Somebody else will be going through it. And, and that what you're struggling with and what you're suffering with, that you're not alone and they've made it through the pain and you'll make it through as well. Can somebody say amen? Amen. amen. You see that? Here's here. You hear that? You hear that crying turn to laughter? Amen. The final thing that we see in this is that is that the pain that we go through is not useless. These women were crying because of what Herod had done to the children. But there was a child that escaped by night. And that child named Jesus was taken down to Egypt. And when he went to Egypt, he was secure. And when he came out of Egypt, he fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies that out of Egypt I had called my son, that he, would, that he would be very much like Moses in that Moses led his people out of Egypt, led God's people out of Egypt, so out of bondage in Egypt, and so Christ would lead his people out of the bondage of sin that Moses was in Egypt and, and brought the people out of Egypt and, and Christ is in Egypt and Christ will come out of Egypt and, as, and, and after he does that, he, he carries his people out of, out of bondage as well. It is a reminder that, uh, that this chapter in this verse that where Rachel is weeping, these women are weeping, 
is not the end of the story. In Lamenta not Lamentations, but in Jeremiah, where that passage is quoted in, in verse 15, it talks about Rachel weeping for her children, but in verse 18, it talks about the deliverance that's going to come uh, in just a short time. He, here, Jesus is taken by night down to, uh, down to Egypt, but he will come back, and he will come back for his people and deliver us from his bondage. That, that lets me know that, 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 yes, it may be a cliche, but, but weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. That, that whatever you're going through right now, it is not the end of the story. It's not the end. I, I heard this uh, cliche, and you've probably heard it before. What, uh, what, has, what, has, uh, what comes in 672 different ways has two writers in one plot? A Hallmark movie, amen. Y'all know that, right? <laughs> Y'all all got every single one got the same plot. Every single one's got the same plot. And, and the truth is most storylines do have a similar plot, isn't it? Two people meet at the beginning of the story and it's a great encounter and everything's going to be perfect and they begin to build on the relationship but sometimes in every single movie there is going to be a form of tension a form of disruption something happens to disrupt that which is perfect and the rest of the movie is is about resolving the very thing that was disrupted now, if you, if you watch a movie, whether it's a Hallmark movie or whether it's, uh, whether it's Avengers, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, the, the Star Wars movie, whether it's the new Mr. Rogers movie, whatever you want, if you turn the movie off, as soon as the tension happens, then you miss the redemptive resolve that will happen at the end. Your mo movies are not 40 minutes long. Your life is not, um, your life is a series of chapters. It is a series of, of scenes. And the scene that you're going through now, the scene that you're crying through now, the tears that are happening in this chapter are going to, uh, are going to bring the fruit that happens in the next chapter. Don't think that the pain and the weeping that you're going through tonight, that you're going through today, that you're going through this, through this season is the end of the story. There, there is a redemption on the other side. You just got to trust that you'll get there and keep moving forward. Your, your story is not over tonight. The story of Christ was not over when Herod dealt with these children in the way that he did. That yes, there might be tears sometimes. And the truth is, we've talked about this. I, you know, I've, I've been in Dayton my whole life. I've never seen a year like the year we've had. Ne never seen a year where we've had just the, the unrest at the beginning of the year. Where we have, go to bed on Memorial Day after watching fireworks and eating hot dogs and waking up to see the devastation that, that hit nearly 30,000 buildings. Spending all summer cleaning up debris and then a shooting at a nightclub, a senseless shooting. We've wept more this year than I think our community ever has. But I'm thankful, amen, that this is not the end. I, 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 listen, I, 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 I've never been so excited to write 2020 on anything, amen. I'm ready to move on. <laughs> this is not the end. And the pain that we went through this last year, somehow, in God's glory, in God's sovereignty, he's going to use for the good of our community and for the good of his people. Yes, may, Rachel may be weeping. Yes, the women of Bethlehem may be weeping. Yes, you may be weeping. But you are not alone. You are not unheard. And there is a purpose for it that God is bringing out for his glory. Father, I thank you. 
I thank you that the Christ child was sent to people that have wept and the people that continue to weep. Father, when we cry out, it is actually a sign of faith that you hear us. And Jesus, the whole story of Christmas, the whole story of the Advent, is that when we cry out to you, and when we can't get to you, that you come to us. When we can't climb up on you, you reach down to where we are. And so, Father, we thank you, and we give you praise for that. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, and our Healer, and our Messiah. Amen.